So I'm not here to bash Dr. Gregor. I have met him, I value the work that he's done for the movement, and it was him amongst others that ultimately got me into nutrition. That being said, there are some things that are fundamentally wrong in his two SIBO videos, and I will point these out. And I will also show you that in many situations, the evidence that he is citing, he has never actually read. And even worse, what he claims the author said is completely different to what they actually published. I have also contacted him and asked him for a live conversation or debate on the videos that he is published and I'm waiting to hear back from him. But if you would like to see this conversation, then please message Dr. Gregor directly on his social media channels. If he's going to label people like myself who advocate SIBO testing a fraud, then he needs to come and back this up further. Now, I'm probably going to have to break down this response into three videos, otherwise this video will be five days long. So in this video, I will break down all the science that is wrong in Dr. Gregor's video titled Fiber versus Low FODMAP for SIBO Symptoms. In my next video, I will break down the science that is wrong in Dr. Gregor's video titled Are Small Intestinal Bacterial Overgrowth Tests Valid? And in the final video, I will do a full literature review on SIBO and SIBO testing so you can see what the actual data says on the topic and not what isolated studies say. All I ask here is that before any of you rush to the comments section, you watch the entire video and the evidence that I put forward before you pass any judgment because I think that most of you will be very surprised how poor the research is in Dr. Gregor's video. Now, before I jump into Dr. Gregor's video, we all need to be on the same page of understanding how you analyze scientific papers. I think that everyone would agree that I could find a study to say that keto diets are great for human health, but that study doesn't show all of the other large body of evidence that says ketogenic diets are probably not optimal for human health. So you absolutely need to look at the totality of evidence to draw conclusions, otherwise you are simply cherry picking data to support your opinion. Beyond this, there are some very common sense steps and stages that you need to analyze any scientific papers. This includes things like seeing if the paper was consistent with other studies in the field. You also need to make sure that the study was designed, conducted, and analyzed correctly. And you also need to check the authors for relevant expertise and any conflicts of interest. Beyond this, you need to make sure the papers are published in legitimate journals with good impact factors. And there are many, many other important steps that you need to analyze research papers. So what I want to do is to go through Dr. Gregor's two videos in their entirety and show you how fundamentally wrong he is with some of his claims. So let's start with the fiber versus FODMAP for SIBO symptoms video. If you test more than a thousand patients suffering from irritable bowel type symptoms such as excess gas, bloating, diarrhea, and abdominal pain for longer than six months, who don't appear to have anything more serious going on such as inflammatory bowel disease, a significant percentage were found to be suffering from lactose intolerance. So before we go any further, let's just have a quick look at the first study that Dr. Greger is using. So it is a relatively new study published in 2019, and the majority of the authors are practicing gastroenterologists. The study design and study protocol are good. They take 1,230 patients with unexplained gastrointestinal problems, including gas and bloating, and they put them through a series of breath tests. They also account for false positives and false negatives by using different tests on each patient, and the statistical analysis for the study was using SPSS, which is an almost industry standard statistical analysis tool. The only way this study could have been made any better would obviously be a larger sample size, and also the patients would have had biopsies to test for things like SIBO to further reduce the risk of false positives and also false negatives. That being said, to increase the sample size and to invasively biopsy see these people, as well as breath testing would significantly put the study costs up. And small scale studies of this type could already be into the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds, if not higher. All in all, the study is a good small trial. The lead author and his team are gastroenterologists. The study is based on trial data and not their opinions, and the conclusion of the study was as follows. Approximately 45% of patients with unexplained gas and bloating had SIBO, fructose, or lactose intolerance. Another 9 to 16% had visceral hypersensitivity, Pre-test symptoms were poor predictors, but symptoms during the breath test were useful. Breath tests are safe, provide significant diagnostic yield, and could be useful in routine gastroenterology practice. 
So this is the first study that Dr. Greger is putting forward, and they are saying that SIBO testing is beneficial. Therefore, I have no problem with the study, as you would expect, other than to repeat, this is an isolated paper and doesn't take into account the other 770 papers that have looked at small intestinal bacterial overgrowth testing between 1973 and 2021. So regardless of whether this showed positive or negative outcomes for breath testing, it is an isolated study and flashing it up on screen proves nothing. So let's see what else Dr. Greger said. Intolerance to the milk sugar lactose. In infancy, we have an enzyme in our small intestines that digests milk sugar, but most of us understandably lose it after weaning. Although a genetic mutation has led to the persistence of the enzyme in a minority of adults, about 75% of the world's population malabsorb lactose and have lactose intolerance after age 30. Yes, I would agree with that. The percentage of those suffering with lactose intolerance will obviously fluctuate depending on the study and ethnicity of the population of people, but I think we would all acknowledge that lactose intolerance is a problem that affects many, and the science supports this. A third, though, were diagnosed with SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. The evidence for SIBO and IBS symptoms is shrouded in controversy, predominantly because of the fact that the breath tests used in clinical practice to diagnose SIBO are not valid, as I explored in the last video. Now we will get to the testing side of things in the next video, and I will go through the science in detail. But before we do this, a few things. So Dr. Greger just said then that SIBO testing is not valid. The NHS or the National Health Service in the UK use them, as do many other health organisations around the world. They are seen as a cheap, non-invasive tool that can be used to help people with unexplained gastrointestinal problems. And this is all repeated in Dr. Greger's first study that he cited. But again, I will delve into the testing in the next video, but I just wanted to respond to that comment here. My main focus here, however, is to pull apart the study that Dr. Greger just flashed up on screen. So the lead author of this paper is Dr. Imran Aziz. He completed his medical training in 2004, and in 2018 returned to lecturing in the UK at Sheffield University as a senior clinical lecturer and honorary consultant gastroenterologist. Dr. Aziz has written about all types of gastrointestinal issues, particularly around food allergy disorders, so that is all very good. The paper that Dr. Aziz published was in the current opinion in Gastroenterology Journal. The optimal word there is opinion. And it should also be said that this journal has an impact factor of around 3.225. An impact factor of an academic journal is a cytometric index calculated by Clarivate that reflects the yearly average number of citations and is frequently used as a proxy for the relative importance of a journal within its field. The range is from 0 plus to 10 plus, and as I said before, the current opinion in Gastroenterology Journal has an impact factor of around 3.225, so it doesn't really carry any weight as a journal. Now, the impact factor is a broad guide, and that is it, but you can see where this journal broadly fits into the scientific landscape. But more importantly than the journal itself, is the paper good? Does it have good study design? What was the outcome of the paper? And so on. And this is where Dr. Greger's study falls apart. This paper didn't really have any study design. It was essentially a very small scale, incomplete literature review, and it wasn't even a trial. It didn't have any inclusion or exclusion criteria for what they were including. They essentially just did a very quick search on PubMed, found 15 very small trials that discussed the topic of breath testing between 2003 in 2016, and then discussed this. So if they'd have found 15 studies that advocated in using breath tests, then no doubt their discussion conclusion would have been very different. So again, the totality of evidence has not been looked at, they had no inclusion or exclusion criteria, and they never assessed the study design in the studies in which they used. It's the equivalent in me coming up with the hypothesis that plant-based diets are optimal for human health, choosing 15 random studies that show plant-based diets have little benefit for human health, and then simply drawing that conclusion. Unless you look at the totality of information, unless you analyse the paper, the journal, and the study design and statistical analysis, then it's a pointless process. So for Dr. Greger to flash up an extract from a pretty subpar paper from a subpar journal, and then label that as proof that SIBO breath tests are invalid is very bizarre indeed. Dr. Greger himself would rightly bash those who advocate meat-based diets using this scientific approach, so I'm not sure it's appropriate for him to use this type of approach himself. But again, I will cover all of the science of testing in the next video. 
it's not even clear what the implications are of having more versus less bacteria growing in your small intestine, since the number don't seem to correlate with symptoms. This is another very clear example of Dr. Greger cherry-picking information. His exact statement he cited from that paper said, moreover, there was no difference in any symptom scores between individuals with small bowel aspirate and more than 10 to 3 versus more than 10 to 5 colony forming units per milliliter. It's an absolute pointless statement to make. So if you have 15 people with C. difficile or H. pylori bacterial infections in the gut, which are very common gastro problems, and then some you breath test and some you biopsy, and then you ask these people to symptom score their own symptoms, which is very subjective, and you will probably see the same things. The number of bacteria present in many diseases and infections won't necessarily reflect the severity of the symptom outcomes. And let me break this down one step further. The poor study that Dr. Gregor is using here is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth as a cause for IBS. Dr. Gregor, as you can see, is using citation 49. That is a reference taken from the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth duodenal aspiration versus glucose breath test study. This study looked at the pros and cons of breath testing, and despite acknowledging what Dr. Greger flashed up on screen, this is the direct conclusion of the researchers. Duodenal aspiration slash culture identifies 45% of patients with suspected SIBO. Glucose breath tests have lower sensitivity but good specificity for detection of SIBO. There were no ethnic or gender differences in the prevalence of SIBO, but patients with SIBO were older. And because glucose breath test is non-invasive, it should be considered first in patients with suspected SIBO. So even the reference that Dr. Greger is using to bash SIBO breath testing is saying to use breath testing because it's non-invasive and inexpensive. It turns out it's not the number, but the type. It's the kind of bugs you have growing in your small intestine. So it's small intestinal microbial dysbiosis, not overgrowth in general, but the wrong kind of growth that appears to underlie symptoms associated with functional gastrointestinal disorders like irritable bowel syndrome. This next section actually beggars belief. So you just heard Dr. Greger categorically say that SIBO is not the amount of bacteria, but the type of bacteria in the small intestines. Let's again go direct to the paper that Dr. Greger is referencing. It says these exact words. SIBO does not correlate with small intestinal microbial dysbiosis. We compared the microbial composition of symptomatic patients with and without SIBO, and found that SIBO does not correlate with small intestinal dysbiosis. This suggests that some symptomatic patients diagnosed with SIBO in fact have an overabundance of bacteria normally found in healthy microbial communities, whereas others who do not have SIBO based on quantitative assessment have dysbiosis as defined here. Here. So again, clearly, Dr. Greger doesn't even read the studies that he is putting up in front of people. It is shockingly bad. How can you prevent this from happening? Well, the symptoms appear to be correlated to a significant drop in the number of Prevotella species. Uh, remember them? Prevotella are healthy fiber feeders, suggestive of a higher fiber intake in healthy individuals, while the bugs found more in symptomatic patients ate sugar, which may reflect a higher dietary intake of sugars. Yes, but correlation doesn't mean causation. To prove cause and effect, you have to put it to the test, which is exactly what they did. Again, he is directly twisting the words of the authors here to suit his own agenda. They, as I've already shown, said that SIBO does not correlate with small intestinal bacterial dysbiosis. And they also said that others who do not have SIBO based on quantitative assessment have dysbiosis as defined, and this was via RNA sequencing. The quotes he is pulling out of the study are relating to people without SIBO and with dysbiosis. Now, I don't know if this is intentional or deliberate, or someone has just waved a script in front of him and asked him to read it, and he has not sanity checked it, but either way, this is very negligent. Switching a group of healthy individuals who habitually ate a higher fiber diet to a more typical standard American low fiber diet with lots of sugar produced striking results within just seven days. First, 80% develop new gastrointestinal symptoms out of the blue, such as bloating and abdominal pain that resolved on resumption of their more healthful, habitual, higher-fiber diet. 
Again, I don't know if this is a deliberate attempt to confuse people or direct negligence, which are both the same thing, but Dr. Greger is taking the findings of how fiber improves digestion in healthy people and extrapolating this to people with SIBO. First, the exact quote that Dr. Greger gave. First, 80% develop de novo gastrointestinal symptoms such as bloating and gas and abdominal pain that resolved on their resumption of their habitual high fiber diet. But the problem with this is it's directly relating to healthy people. If you decrease fiber in healthy people, then you will likely increase gastrointestinal symptoms such as gas and bloating and pain. And I don't think that too many people would disagree with that. But here is exactly what the authors of the paper said regarding SIBO. Third, SIBO present in eight, 50% of the individuals consuming a high fiber diet at baseline, disappeared in three and developed among two after the intervention, neither the resolution nor appearance of SIBO correlated with symptoms. So let me just get that straight, a very poor low level discussion paper, which had eight people diagnosed with SIBO, three of which improved with more fiber, and two later got diagnosed with SIBO after eating a high fiber diet, Dr. Greger is using as proof that people with all gastrointestinal problems should increase their fiber intake, which is absolutely absurd. Even in the study he is citing, only one person improved with SIBO after eating a high fiber diet. He massively manipulated one study and then has done the same in the second study to suit his agenda that high fiber diets work for everyone. And the diet related changes in the small intestinal microbiome were predictive of symptoms and linked to an alteration in intestinal permeability. In other words, they developed a leaky gut within seven days. And while some went from SIBO positive to SIBO negative, or SIBO negative to SIBO positive, it didn't matter, since the number of bacteria growing didn't correlate with symptoms, it was the type of bacteria growing. Again, we've already touched upon this. Many diseases don't have a direct correlation with the amount of bacteria and the severity of the problem. C. difficile and H. pylori are prime gastro problems that don't always correlate. Many people with more bacteria don't always have a worse infection, but they still have the infection that needs to be dealt with. Based on Dr. Greger's logic, is he also suggesting that these are diseases that don't exist? And again, I just want to bring the conversation back around to the quality of the evidence presented. There are 1,888 articles for the search term SIBO in PubMed. Dr. Greger is going to one of the smallest studies that he can find that supports his argument that fiber somehow fixes SIBO problems. It is absolutely absurd. And no wonder their guts got leaky, short-chain fatty acid levels plummeted. Those are the magical byproducts that our good gut bugs make from fiber, which play an important role in intestinal barrier integrity, meaning keeping our gut from getting leaky. Again, this has no relevance to his arguments with SIBO patients struggling with SIBO. The authors here were again talking about healthy patients. When you eat fiber, this is fermented by your gut bacteria, and this produces short-chain fatty acids such as propionate and also butyrate. If you reduce fiber, the short-chain fatty acid production is reduced, and this is all that the researchers are saying. But again, this has no relevance to the fiber argument that Dr. Greger is trying to make around SIBO. So while we don't have sound data that something like a low FODMAP diet has any benefit for SIBO symptom patients, there have been more than a dozen randomized control trials putting fiber to the test, and overall there was a significant improvement in symptoms among those randomized to increase their fiber intake. Again, this is cherry picking data that is not relevant to the question in hand, that is SIBO. If you have people on standard Western type diets and you take them away from this and increase the fiber, then yes, many would feel better. But we are not talking about these people. We are referring directly to people with SIBO and also suspected SIBO. Now, I just want to quickly read some of the comments from Dr. Greger's own video so you can see how out of touch with the topic he really is. Charlie Fader says, I hope there is at least another video for SIBO or IBS type symptoms because this is not helpful for people who are already on a whole foods plant-based diet for a long time and still see no improvement. Eloise says, Dr. Greger, please talk more about methane producing archaea SIBO. My main symptoms are constipation and bloating, but fiber doesn't seem to help. A Atrantil is the thing that has helped me, though I don't know how this works. Michael D says, anybody who is already on a high fiber plant-based diet and has SIBO symptoms is not comforted by the eat more fiber advice. Wayne 
Wayne Rogers says a little misleading. I was vegan when the bloating and gases become unbearable. The low FODMAP diet worked. I can't speak to the science. I just know what works. Circle Square says this is very interesting, but unfortunately does nothing to help the people already on high fiber diets who have SIBO symptoms and many of whom seem to be helped by SIBO protocols. There needs to be more support for plant-based dieters who have digestive issues rather than it's all in your head or go back to eating meat, switch the carnivore diet dismissal. Now I implore each and every one of you to go to the comment section of Dr. Gregor's video titled Fiber versus Low FODMAP for SIBO symptoms and read what people are saying and you will see how ridiculous Dr. Gregor's comments are and suggestions are for people with SIBO related problems. To boil it all down into just eat more fiber is unbelievably naive and I can categorically say that if most of the people that I work with did this, then they would be crippled with symptoms. That may actually help explain why high fiber plant-based diets may prevent so many common diseases. The effects such diets have on the composition and metabolic activity of our microbiome. Our good gut bugs take the plant residues like fiber and produce health-promoting and cancer-suppressing metabolites like those short-chain fatty acids, which have profound anti-inflammatory properties. Great, we all know this, but again, it's irrelevant when the question in hand is SIBO and the people you are telling to eat more fiber can't actually do it. All the evidence points to a physiological need for about 50 grams of fiber a day, which is the amount contained in the traditional African diet and associated with the prevention of westernized diseases. That's approximately twice what's typically recommended and three times more than what most people are getting day to day. Again, zero relevance to SIBO. Perhaps it should be no surprise we need so much. Even though we split from chimpanzees millions of years ago, there's still broad congruency in the composition of our respective microbiomes to this day. While they're still eating their 98 to 99% plant-based diets to feed their friendly flora with fiber, we've largely removed fiber-rich foods from our food supply. Yes, but these primates don't have antibiotics to contend with that can trigger SIBO. They don't have gut motility issues caused by poor diets that can cause SIBO. They don't take other medications that can cause SIBO. They don't usually get post-infectious IBS that causes SIBO. They don't eat diets that impact on stomach acid in a way that many diets do. So this is all irrelevant. I can't tell you how disappointed I am with this video. You manipulate and twist facts that the authors never actually said. You make out that SIBO does not even exist and that it's dysbiosis that's the problem. And then to add insult to injury, you then offer the solution to SIBO as simply a need to eat more fiber, and then you don't even have the decency to respond to your subscribers and viewers who are crippled by your eat more fiber advice. I just don't get it. Dr. Gregor, Dr. Clapper, and Dr. McDougall have all said the same thing about SIBO and SIBO symptoms, in that people should just eat more fiber. I don't know why on earth they are not up to speed with these topics, or why it is so hard for these doctors to acknowledge that people can have gut issues eating plants. And these are meant to be evidence-based practitioners. In my next video, I will respond to Dr. Gregor's claims about SIBO testing, and will pull apart all of that evidence. If you enjoyed this video, then be sure to check out this one up here, because I'm sure you'll find it equally interesting. And the only other thing that's left for me to say is to remember to look after your body, because it's the only place you have to live. And I'll see you next time.